You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. In this month's episode, we are exploring the world of engineering in sport and how sports technology is not just improving the performance of elite athletes, but is having an effect on ordinary fitness fans and even medicine and healthcare. Sports engineering is the technical application of physics, maths, biomechanics, computer science and even aeronautical engineering to solve sporting problems. According to the International Sports Engineering Association, sports engineering includes tasks such as designing equipment, building facilities, analysing athletes' performance, regulating standards and safety requirements and developing coaching tools. It could be argued that the use of technology in sport began as far back as the ancient Olympics when chariots were used for racing and the athletes competed in the pentathlon, which did involve wearing armour as I understand it. But modern sports technology really began to appear in the 19th century and commercially available examples of innovative equipment, such as tennis rackets, golfing equipment and cricket helmets, were all on show at the Great Exhibition of 1851. But it wasn't until 1998 that Professor Steve Hake of Sheffield Hallam University founded the International Sports Engineering Association, thus formalising sports engineering as a discipline in its own right. Today, there are very few sports that do not involve some kind of engineering, and the typical sports engineer works directly with the athlete to monitor and measure their performance, behaviour and interaction with said equipment to ensure that they are at peak physical fitness. It's safe to say that many of the sports brands we see sponsoring events or even have in our own gym bags would not be the big names we know today without the work of sports engineers. So what kind of work are sports engineers doing? I spoke with engineers Andy Harland, Professor of Sports Technology and the Director of the Sports Technology Institute at Loughborough University, and Dr Tom Allen, Senior Lecturer in Sports Engineering at Manchester Metropolitan University. Professor Andy Harland is a chartered mechanical engineer and is involved in research across a broad range of topics, including measurement and instrumentation, product design and development, injury prevention and simulation. He has worked on a number of projects concerned with sports, footwear, apparel and protective gear. Andy's research in soccer balls has been applied by Adidas in tournaments including the FIFA World Cup and the UEFA European Champions League and his research in cricket helmet impacts underpinned the revision of the British Standard 7928-2013, specifications for head protection for cricketers. I started by asking Andy to give us his perspective on what sports engineers do, and to share his experiences of working with elite athletes. Andy, thank you ever so much for joining me today on the podcast. I've got a few questions that I think I think our listeners actually will be really interested to hear the answer to. What actually is a sports engineer or sports technologist and what type of engineering do they employ to develop technology for people in sport? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think in the, the simple answer, perhaps facetious answer, is there's no such thing as a sports engineer. Um, a sports engineer is an engineer. Uh, they just happen to be working in a in a field of study that we call sport. Um, but when you when you look across sport, it, it includes all kinds of dimensions that you see in everyday life, in mainstream industry, um, and actually the the provision of products and services to athletes, to stadiums, to sports clubs, 
uh, to recreational participants um, involves an awful lot of engineering skill right from design through analysis through monitoring instrumentation um, data uh, etc so you know I suspect that that whatever form of engineer you might be there is a role for you in sport and I guess that probably makes you a sports engineer. I think that's a really good answer. <laughs> it was something that I uh, I wasn't really sort of familiar with, and I kept seeing this term, sports engineers. But but absolutely, you're right. As engineers, we bring together so many different fields, different disciplines, and actually apply it to the the problem we're trying to solve, aren't we? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the mathematics and the physics don't change. Um, you know, if you're trying to determine what material that you should make a particular structure from then whether it's supporting traffic across a bridge or whether it's supporting a Paralympian's um, limb, you know, the same principles apply and, you know, we, we solve the problems in the same way, yeah. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm really interested to, to focus a little bit on the elite sports uh, side of things. And despite, obviously, we've had a rather subdued Olympic Games this year, technological innovation still continues to drive uh, elite sport performance, doesn't it? And, and we're not just talking about, you know, shoes and rackets and, and th- those sort of things. We're talking about some really complex engineering going in to help create these athletes and get them to peak fitness. C- can you tell us a little bit about what some of those innovations are and, and maybe some of the types of developments that you've been working on? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, I guess it's worth reflecting on what elite sport is. It is the pinnacle of, of human performance in lots of ways, but it's also entertainment. The, the, the whole product of the Olympics or the, the World Cup football and so on isn't just about the singular moment of elite performance. It's about the, the, the competition, the, the, the journey that people have been on, the qualifying, the rounds, the tournaments, the, you know, the events that go into it. So there's quite an interesting dimension there, which is, is, that, is the task to try to create an athlete who can, as a one-off, create a moment and break a record? Or is it somebody that can actually sustain the journey that they're going on? You know, be, be ready, be fit, remain healthy, um, be in a good place, if you like, to, to deliver what you know the, the 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 result that they want. So my observation over the last few years is that there's been an awful lot of uh, effort that's gone into the preparation of the athletes, the the recovery, the injury prevention. Um, you know these things that that, that that perhaps aren't aren't in the in the front line of people's thinking when when it comes to sport. But sleep products, sleep technology, sleep monitoring. Um, monitoring of of recovery from injury spotting sort of behavioral trends or 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 training performance trends that suggest to a very well informed and qualified coach that perhaps something's not quite right and we need to take it easy for a few days to prevent an injury um etc etc so so there's an awful lot going on in the background of course in addition to the, the sort of more obvious things um like the the, the footwear and and the the ability to manufacture um, shoes that have uh, tuned um, stiffnesses and and uh, sort of energy return to benefit a particular athlete in a particular running style um, and of course the, the the surfaces that they're running on so you know every Olympics there'll be a slightly different track surface that's that's put together so you know technology is going a long way to both prepare the athlete, um, but also try to give them some kind of competitive advantage in terms of the products that they're, that they're going to be using. So there's an awful lot of um, what I would consider to be engineering um, that goes right through that, that, that journey. Yeah, indeed. I think there's there's a, we only see, I suppose, as spectators that that very short window where the the, the athlete is right at the peak of their physical um, fitness. But actually, there's years and weeks and months of of work gone into getting them to that point, hasn't there? That we we don't often realise, and we don't realise the amount of technology that goes in to help them do that. Yeah, and you know, if you take that right the way back to the beginning, um, I think. Every single uh, winner, every single elite athlete, 
and began their their their, their interest in the sport probably probably as a child, um, but almost certainly for enjoyment. And you know, one of the biggest tasks facing certain sports, um, particularly minority sports, is to actually engage youngsters and actually give them an enjoyable experience. And you know, some years ago now, you look at um, a sort of a real effort being made in the design of equipment for 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 children and juniors. Now, I don't think that work is complete. There's still plenty more we can do, but if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, you know, a set of, ch- of children's golf clubs were simply a miniature version of an adult's golf clubs. And, and for those of us that, that tried out sports, particularly rackets sports, you'd often end up with this really uncomfortable feeling. It was e- either very fatiguing, very tiring because these things were too heavy, or you couldn't quite get the performance out of them. And it, it's no surprise because they weren't really, there was no real design thought that had gone into them. They were just miniature representations of what worked for adults. And so if you, if you sort of play that forwards, there's almost certainly um, a generation of, of very, very capable um, athletes who gave up the sport after the first try and never continued. So actually engaging children, getting them interested in a particular sport, um, retaining their interest is as important as um, you know, working with the few that do make it through to the to the elite level um, to perform in the end. So, you know, lots of really fascinating studies that are, that are looking at, um, if you like, the anthropometrics of, of of children. You know, the dynamic anthropometrics of of not well, not only children, but all kinds of um, demographics to understand how we can design a product for them, which in the first instance really comes down to enjoyment rather than performance. Um, and, you know, performance will come from enjoyment. Yeah, I, I can honestly say I was put off by, uh, uh, put off of a, a number of sports over the years by just by sheer, the the, the weight of uh, of equipment that that I was expected to use as a, as a child, uh, particularly javelin. I, I found, <laughs> I, I loved javelin, yeah. but... Um, the javelins that we used back then were were just, I think, just av- adult javelins. They were way too heavy for us. But yeah, absolutely. And, and that leads me on to to another um, issue, weird, really. And you touched on it previously that how do we keep athletes safe and comfortable when it comes to trying wringing all of that performance out of them? You know, as they as they travel through their professional career, how how does this, the engineer? balance that issue of needing to improve the technical achievements with the sort of the ethical and even the healthcare issues? Uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. And, and I, think, um, I, I think it's probably not dissimilar to, a, to an awful number of spheres of engineering, that actually the very best engineers don't isolate themselves into one compartment and say, we're only here to consider performance or we're only here to, to, to consider safety um, because to understand particularly in the case of products that are going to be used by human beings to understand human psychology and and and, and so on is, is to recognize that you know very few users will make a singular choice um, between those that there are, there are all kinds of compromises going on um, you know some really simple examples of, of of protective gear that's designed um, for sport, and, and cricket is a, is a is a sport that I've done an awful lot of work in. And what you found when you actually engaged with some of the the, the, the participants, and I'm talking players that have played at the very highest level, was that you'd provide them, or somebody's provided them with a pair of gloves, for example. And, and if they are uncomfortable and don't let them perform to the best of their ability, they were taking this pair of scissors out. They were cutting holes in them. They were bluntly compromising their safety um, to to improve their performance. And and when you think about it, and, and you listen to them, it, it, it becomes perfectly obvious. You know, these guys perhaps started playing when they were five years old. They're now 25. They've just been called up into the national team. This is their moment. This is what their life has all been about. If there's anything that is going to stop them performing at their highest level, they they don't mind 
risking an injury, you know, sometimes quite a serious injury. They, they, that's not on their mind. They, they, it's not in their mind that they're at any danger because if it was, that is taking something away from their positive attitude to perform when they go go out on the field. So actually, you know, of course it's easier to say we can design something that is 100% safe. You know, we, we'd put our athletes into suits of armour in any impact sports. But actually that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that we've got to do it in a way that allows them to perform to the, an ability that they are, um, uh, you know, prepared to compromise to, if that makes sense. Um, and that's going to be different from an elite athlete to a to a novice, to from a child, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, the 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 the, the challenge is facing an engineer to um, you know compromise is, is probably the right word, but I don't mean it in in the sense that you, you you've given up on some of your design criteria. It's it's to actually understand what success looks like in a product when you're designing and developing it um to suit the needs of the end user. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I suppose in in the terms of, of working with that elite end uh, of sport, you you're obviously creating very bespoke pieces of technology for for each individual sports person. But how do those sort of things roll down to to kind of us ordinary folk who occasionally, you know, maybe go to the gym or or whatever because I, I was reading um reading some really interesting articles around some of the technology that's now making its way into the average everyday sort of sports person's market, things like motion capture, for example, for for amateur footballers. And I was also seeing a really interesting article on how the Australian Tennis Open have combined the Hawkeye system with some other technologies to enable visually impaired spectators to, to follow the game more accurately. So, one of the things I was quite curious about was was how do some of these very bespoke technologies that you've been describing there, how do they make that into kind of our everyday environment? Yeah, I think there's there's a load of really interesting points that you make there. There is this kind of uh, um, historic approach to sports apparatus, which is that it is, you know, the, the detail of the design that goes in at the, at the elite level um, and, and the the, the the mass market, which is of course where a lot of these these companies are making their money, um, is simply what they what they would call takedowns of the elite products. So you're developing for for somebody that's that, that is truly elite, and then um, you know you simply copy it and try and manufacture it in a cheaper and more affordable way for for the mass market. Now, clearly in this in the world of sport and a lot of sports products branding. Um, and, and color segues and these sorts of things are sufficient to persuade the, the, the consumer to go to a sports store and buy it because it, it looks the same. But I think, you know, we, we started using a phrase, you know, some, some years ago, which is, is one size fits no one. And, and actually recognizing that certainly when it comes to sizing, but also when it comes to the sort of detailing of, of, of products, that unless you really can specifically tune the product at the elite end, and, and of course, when you think about mass manufacture of some of these products, if you are making a, a single sample for a particular athlete, you generally speaking, the, 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 the standard manufacturing processes are not available to you either. So you, you're actually making prototypes, really, um, the, the fewer um, samples you're making. So if you are truly only designing around one athlete, you're not actually making it in the way that you would make it for the mass market anyway. So there's actually quite a difference between what is being provided to the recreational um, consumer and what is being provided to the elite athlete. Now, there are all kinds of limiting factors to that, the complexities of supply chains and manufacturing processes and available materials and all of these things. Um, and, you know, this is where, you know, my world sort of gets interesting because it, it, it's detached from sport in a lot of ways, but, but new manufacturing processes and the advent of of sort of additive processes and 3D printing and these sorts of things, particularly as it's starting to appear that this maybe um, is capable of supplying the mass or, or a larger sector of the market. So previously, 3D printing was fine, but it, you could only really make one or two and, and deal with your elite performers. But but as we start to think about, can we manufacture directly for the consumer? That gives us the opportunity to do some 
so to take some measurements to 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 bring some insights from the particular consumer so that perhaps a product can be built around their own needs now that hasn't happened yet um the 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 engineering technology is is nearly there you know we do have some methods um and some materials that would be suitable but of course you've then got the the whole challenge of the of the provision to the consumer so how, how how what would happen to retail what would happen to distribution how do we actually make this work in practice you know in what is undoubtedly a global industry so there, there are still lots of challenges some of which you might argue are outside of engineering <laughs> um but you know that's where it's heading i think on the digital side um i think it's really interesting because of course we all have in our pockets on our phones more computing power than would have been been dreamt of in, in in by previous generations and you know an increasing number of smart people are realizing that actually um the data that we can make available to um consumers and to to, to you and i just in our in, in whatever we go about doing um wouldn't have been available to elite performers 20 30 years ago and so i think that has has um encouraged a generation of creative people um you know and there's there's a there's a real magic that happens when you get creatives alongside techs um to start to imagine new business ventures new products new services that as you say can can make technology that was once the preserve of the the elite competitions available for the consumer um you know smart watches um footballs that have little tracking sensors in them and performance sensors in them that you know you now see youtube videos of of kids with a smart ball going out and 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 uh, being able to record data on how well they're kicking it being able to observe their own improvement um you know this sort of real-time feedback you know wasn't as available as as it is now um and so you know for me the idea that let's imagine my son now spends an hour in the garden playing football rather than 20 minutes and getting bored, you know, that's as much of a success as somebody winning uh, a, an elite level race because it's making a difference to his, his attitude towards sport, his well being, his health, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's little triumphs to be had through development of technology in sport at all levels. Yeah, I, I can agree with that quite a lot. Um, the, the opportunities that this technology is enabling people to get out more, to be doing more, that there's some, been some great um, initiatives to encourage people to use all of that computing power, as you rightly said, that we have in our pockets, um, to be able to encourage them to, to be more active. And I think that positive um, outcome from this kind of work that you're doing, this, this very intensive research um, is is really benefiting wider society, isn't it? From from a, a you know that point of view, absolutely. It's 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 real. It's tangible. It it it, it makes a you know when when we get it right, it makes an obvious difference. It brings enjoyment. There's a quality of life argument to it. I think you know the last um, eighteen months that in terms of everybody's, I think, you know, a lot, an awful lot of people have reevaluated, you know, what life's all about over the last few months. And, and I think, um, little pleasures, um, enjoyments, connectivity, feeling part of something, um, and, and looking after ourselves has, have, have all become really important. And I think, you know, on the one hand, and, and I think it myself sometimes, you know, what I'm doing in sport doesn't really matter. You know, when you see some massive breakthrough in, in, in medicine or space travel or whatever you think, oh, well, you know, I, I'm a qualified engineer. Why, why am I messing around in sport? But then there are those other moments where you think, actually, you know what, in terms of a difference to somebody's life or, or particularly in a safety environment, when you, when, you know, when, I, when you receive a letter that says, you know, thanks for your work on the standards panel for, for cricket helmets, you know, my son was hit and he's thankfully he's been fine. Now, I dare say he would have been fine anyway. It's not down to me, you know. But it is heartwarming that that people do do recognise the significance of an engineer's role in 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 just little moments of quality of life that we all we all can enjoy. 
I think I think that is a, an important part for us all as engineers to reflect on that that we do have a big important role to play in ensuring that people have a quality of life and that's that regardless of what field of engineering we're in. So just just to end Andy on on this what what do you think have been the the most significant changes or challenges that that the sports technology industry has faced over the last 10 years and, and where do you see it going in the future you know what are going to be the next big things that we're going to see coming out i i think again that's a, that's a, a really good question and a few years ago you know i would undoubtedly have answered that question with an engineering answer i'd have been talking about you know emerging manufacturing processes i'd have been talking about materials um i'd have been talking about monitoring and instrumentation tools but for me there's 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 two really 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 clear drivers at the moment um one of which is uh, sustainability um and one of which is inclusivity and and these are clearly not challenges that are limited to sport and they're not challenges that are limited to um, engineering um and i think you know that really excites me that the, these are topics that you know, unite a large, large section of the population on on the planet. That actually, you know, a lot of sporting goods are um, relatively um, cheap and mass produced, and you know, typically involve an, an awful lot of energy resource to produce, and a lot of travel, transportation costs, um, and and waste, and so on and so forth. Um, and the opportunity that the sports sector, sports industry has, and, and you know, has already made a significant start in this. I should should point out is that it is largely unregulated. If you look at the sports industry, it isn't like the oil and gas industry, the medical industry, the um, you know automotive sector, etc., where you have, for very good reasons, a, a set of regulations and rules and compliance processes and so on which are effectively barriers to entry for new technologies um sport doesn't have any of those the vast majority of limitations are the laws of the game which are you know put together by committees of people who who govern the sport so the opportunity to bring new technologies to bring new materials to bring innovation and use sport as a as a test platform um, you know, for me, is hugely powerful. And as we all recognise the need to move across to, you know, renewable energies and and reduce our energy use and, and reduce the wastage and the emissions and so on of, of, of everything that we do, you know, I think there are enormous potentials in sport to to be um, those test cases. You know, to to really pioneer um, new approaches to to, to, to problem solving and. The exact same thing applies to the inclusivity agenda. You know, we we were quite open in sport that we were predominantly interested in the elite. We knew that there was, uh, so for every elite athlete that, that made it, there was probably another 10 or 20 who didn't quite make it. And we generally didn't take much interest in, in what, you know their life experiences or what ended up happening to them um but but as well there were a load of people who were never given the opportunity in the first place you know either their their interests as a child weren't weren't quite there or somebody decided that they weren't any good or um you know they had some development needs that weren't met by sport etc and and you know I, i don't think sport ever knowingly discriminated against them but actually that's what we've learned over the last few years is that every single person has the right to be taken seriously when it comes to their own health well-being enjoyment sport and so on and i think some of the um initiatives that are now looking at paralympics has been great to raise awareness and raise profile of this and we've actually seen some really cool technologies that are coming along and and, and i'm sure everybody's watched the paralympics and gone wow how has how have they done that you know, and that's yeah. largely down to the, you know, to the to the resilience and the person and the skill of the of the individual participants, supported by the technologies that allow them to do what people didn't think they would be able to do. Uh, and I think, you know, illustrating two ends of a spectrum, but we all sit somewhere 
on that spectrum. And, and, and we all matter. <laughs> and actually, the, 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 the challenge to engineers is to, is to say, I'm not just going to pick the easy option and design products to suit that sector of that spectrum. I'm actually going to take on the bigger challenge, which is how do we make things work for everybody? Um, and so I think that's where, um, I don't know how we're going to solve it, but I think that's what the sports sector and the sports engineering sector is going to really be focused on in the next few years. I, I think that is a wonderful sentiment to to hold dear. And and I think it's the true nature of engineering in some respects is that we want to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to be able to participate in whatever it is, whether it be sport or any other aspect of life. And I think it's in, in our nature as engineers to want to try and uh, achieve that for everyone. So I, I think that is a, a great focus to have. Uh, in terms of the work that you do, um, and and I, I feel quite excited about some of the technologies that are actually coming out of of the sports technology industry because they are actually impacting on on a, a great deal of other areas. I mean, you've talked about health and safety, you've talked about you know um, inclusivity, you've talked about sustainability. All of these are um, affecting other areas of, of our profession as engineers, and and it's you know we're going to learn quite a lot, I think, from what you're doing. So thank you ever so much for taking the time to to talk to me today. I'm I'm really excited to see what the the next things are to come out of the sports technology industry. So thanks a lot, Andy. No problem. Thanks very much for inviting me. Dr. Tom Allen is also a chartered mechanical engineer and his research is focused on the effects of sports engineering and technology in terms of the performance, participation and injury risk to athletes. Tom applies computational mechanics and computer-aided engineering to his analysis, as well as an understanding of the application of materials and the impact they have on performance. Tom is also the editor-in-chief of the ISEA's Sports Engineering Journal. I began by asking Tom to explain how innovation for athletes makes its way down to recreational sports and even into healthcare. Tom, thank you for joining me today and welcome to the podcast. Now, I spoke with my last guest, Andy, about sports innovations for elite sports, but you've been focused on improving public health, haven't you, and how we get the general public to be more involved in sport. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing? Yes, I can. So a lot of my work, as you say, is about trying to get people more active, try to get them more engaged in sport. And also when, when they are doing the sport to enjoy it more and then hopefully stick with it longer and, and have fewer fewer injuries. So we work in, in different areas. And one of the areas which we work in is, is materials. So we develop new materials. Hopefully they can help to, Im- to improve the sports equipment. That could be trainers, which might last for longer to allow people to run for further and have fewer injuries, better protective equipment, for example, or with prosthesis as well. So prosthesis, which may fit better and then allow people to engage in sport and and play and and, and exercise. So, I mean, you're talking there about, about sort of prosthetics and things. So what sort of, um, sort of work have you been doing in that area? So I, so I worked on a, on a project, which was part of a Starworks network. So Starworks, is a network which is all about developing prosthetic devices for, for children. And we were looking at auxetic materials. So auxetic materials have a negative Poisson's ratio. That means that when you when you pull them, they they expand and when you compress them, they contract. So that's the opposite to, to normal normal materials and the way they behave. And we can make these materials in different ways, but one way that we can make them is to 3D print them. So we can 3D print them in a specific structure that behaves in a certain way. So what we were doing was we're 3D printing this liner to go in the prosthesis that will it will conform and move and fit to the individual. And and you were talking there as well about running shoes. You you've been involved in some developments um, for for elite athletes with uh, running shoes, haven't you? So yeah, so I work with um, diff- different companies. So a lot of the work that we do, we try and stay quite fundamental, but we always go out and we talk to the different companies and we present at conferences and share and share what we're doing. And then they may take our ideas and then look at developing 
different shoes and, and, and applying those in different ways. And, and most of the stuff that I do is around the materials. Right. So some of the, the research that um, I've, I've seen that you've been involved in has been focusing on uh, the use of computer and mathematical modelling and simulation. And obviously that's around the sort of materials you've been talking about. Is that just then for, for sports equipment or are you working with the athletes too? And how does that translate into the finished sports product or, or a change in athletes' behaviour? So most of what we do is is more around the equipment um, rather than the, the athlete itself. So a lot of what we do is protective equipment. So we're developing new materials simulating those materials in in the computer as you you were saying and predicting how they would perform but rather than modeling the human we might make a surrogate of that human and then we would we would model that so for example we've got a project looking at at rugby padding and we're looking at how that can prevent skin and soft tissue injuries so we would make a, a surrogate of the body region Maybe it would have some soft tissue simulant, like a silicon or something like this. We would characterize the materials of that and we'd put that into our model rather than trying to create a model of the human skin. Right. Okay. So so you're not working directly with the athlete themselves, but you're you're making kind of um models that will will predict their behaviors and 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 then how do you then go about turning that into something the athlete will will use or or whatever how do you get from that model back to the human so so usually what we do is we we use the model because the idea of the model is it's actually quite hard to capture that that variability of these individual people and then we have all that variability in our experiment so we so we have the the simulant or the kind of the surrogate which, which we'd use which is the idea is that will capture lots of people and, and, and we simulate that. And then the next step is if we can get that working to extrapolate to, to the people. So usually what we do is we try to demonstrate the proof of concept with our research and then we would partner with the industry, you know, the industry partner who yeah. has more of the expertise in bringing the products to market and that was where they, they would come in and take it to the next step. Right, okay. So you make the kind of technical demonstrator and then they they do the work to to actually make it into a fully-fledged product. Exactly, because we're, we're, we're researchers. So, so our expertise is the research. We can do things in the university. We can come up with new ideas and demonstrate concepts, but we're not experts in bringing things to market, producing things, you know, developing things. That, that's not really our area. What, what we have to do is... In, is have the inspiration, show that to the companies, and then if they're interested, they can take that and then take that into the final final product. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I'm I'm quite interested in is this idea of of modifying uh, equipment to to improve performance, and, and it, it's certainly nothing new. As usually, you've been talking about this is the nature of of um, sports engineering and sports technology development, but we often hear about these marginal gains that that can be made by changing just just a few aspects of of uh, of, of a a piece of clothing or or a ball or even a running shoe as you've mentioned but when do these gains go too far tom M- you know my my thoughts are going back to the the US swimming team and the controversy around the the uh, LZR swimsuits in the the Beijing 20 um it was 2008, wasn't it? The 2008 Beijing Olympics, you know, and and afterwards they were banned the, that those those swimming costumes. So, at what point do we say technology has gone too far, or it outperforms the athlete's ability uh, to to take part in the sport? So, what we're getting to there is maybe more of a philosophical question rather than a rather than an engineering question. Yeah. <laughs> so, everybody will have their their own interpretation of what might be too far or what might you know not be fair or or however they, they might they might phrase it but really i guess it's when it becomes more about the equipment than the athlete that's probably the point when you're saying yeah. that it that it's too far so for example with the swimming if you you have 10 athletes you know they turn up to to a swimming race and actually it's not the best athlete that wins it's the athlete that has the best the best swimsuit mm. but if you've got 10 athletes that are that are all good and they're all wearing the same swimsuit and that swimsuit gives them a little bit of an edge but they're all going faster then it's a it's a different debate so i think the idea is if it's well the technology is influencing who 
might win that event, then you could be arguing that it's going going too far. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I suppose in some respects the the it's that um, advantage of of countries who are investing an awful lot into sports technology versus those countries that that perhaps can't afford to to invest that that level um, of of technology into their athletes and and therefore are put at a at a, a disadvantage because of the nature of the fact that it's it's down to money. Yes, that 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 is true. So you could argue that you know the richer companies have countries have better equipment, and then the athletes in those countries are, are doing better than the athletes from the other countries who don't have such great equipment but when when you start then sort of stepping back a little bit and looking at it um, a bit broader there's many advantages that those people from the richer countries have over those from the poorer countries so it's not necessarily well this person has a better swimsuit or a better pair of trainers or a better bike they probably also have better training facilities as well and maybe they have more time to spend training so it's it's actually quite a, a complicated argument. It goes beyond just the specific equipment they're using in the race. They may have an entourage of 20 or 30 people who are helping them with their training compared to someone else who, who's on their own. So it's, that, yeah, there, there is definitely issues between the amount of support or the, or the equipment that athletes have from different places. And it's not necessarily an easy problem to, to solve there, there is you could argue no such thing as a completely level playing field absolutely yes and and I suppose as engineers we we have to take an approach where we we have to at least try and um, ensure that the technology itself is at least available to as many people as possible even if uh, it comes down to the marketing people who uh, who are the ones who are going to sell it um now I'm really fascinated by by what's going to come next in sport. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a sporty person myself. I have to say, uh, I'm I'm far from being particularly athletic, but um, but I'm really fascinated by by this kind of um, issue around uh, how technology is going to advance um, our athletes you know, beyond maybe their capabilities. But what sort of technologies do you think are going to be the next big breakthrough? Where are you seeing, um, you know, the the investments and the, uh, and the research being done at the moment? And what are you looking forward to seeing being part of the athlete's kit in the future? So I'm very much a mechanical engineer and I'm interested in, in materials. So I think there's going to be more materials kind of innovations. We're going to see new materials like we've seen with running shoes, where we've seen new foams and a new kind of composite plates being being used in the shoes. As I was saying before, my research is on auxetic materials, so materials which expand as, as you pull them. And I would expect that we're going to be seeing more products coming out which have these auxetic properties. So that's that's one side, and that's very much aligned to my research. But But more generally... I think that we're going to start seeing more more use of sensors. Yeah. So traditionally, you, know, you might have worn a heart rate sensor. Now we're seeing all sorts of different sensors which which are worn on, on the body. That might go as far as saying, okay, so we've got these sensors. We can now start using machine learning and predicting things from from these sensors. So from one measurement, you can maybe predict something else. Some some work which we've recently accepted into the Sports Engineering Journal with a sensor, they're predicting the running surface that the athlete is is running on. So whether they're running on sand or, or a hard surface, that can then have implications for calculations about how much energy they're using, which then can feed into, into public health. So mm-hmm. I think we're going to see more use of sensors, but then I think that will then trickle down into the into the public and we'll have this idea about more of like a, a smart kind of health program. So a lot of people will wear some kind of fitness watch that will track how much exercise that they're doing. And then maybe one day we'll go to the doctor and rather than the doctor saying, how are you? Are you healthy? They, they say, right, I'm going to look at your data. Actually, you have been exercising a lot. That's good. I can see you've been running, you know, X times a day or whatever, or Actually, I can see you're telling me that you're doing this, but <laughs> but but you're not. So yeah, I, I think we're going to see more of a kind of sort of smart kind of healthcare 
kind of system. Uh, that's something that I, I would love to see myself. And I hope that at some point that sort of technology, that, that sensor um, development will get to the point where it, it is more accepted by the, the health professionals uh, in terms of recording data, because that's something that we're not really seeing at the moment, is it? That, that pickup from, from healthcare professionals in terms of trusting the data that they're seeing. So I suppose your role as an engineer is to try and get that um, sensor data and sensor uh, um, data collection uh, as accurate as possible so that it can be more acceptable within those healthcare domains. Exactly. So a lot of the work that we do as engineers will be, you know, taking a sensor and checking how accurate it is. So doing some very basic tests, all about accuracy, repeatability, making sure that it does actually do what it claims to be doing. So a company may release a sensor and says that it does all these fancy things and it will do that for you and what we do is okay we're going to go back and do some basic sort of calibration tests and validation tests and see if it can actually perform uh, as it does that can then allow you as i was saying to have this sort of smart kind of system where it's monitoring your exercise which could be feeding to your doctor and then you could actually take that full circle when you go to the doctor you could be being prescribed to do exercise and then they could be monitoring how much exercise you're doing so it's a completely different um, sort of healthcare system, maybe more of a kind of prevention is better than cure. So you're having these sort of regular checks and being prescribed you know, things to be doing. Well, Tom, I am looking forward to the day when we see this high performance technology that's kind of been developed at these really elite levels, making it down to the likes of me, who is a total couch potato and really needs to be encouraged to do more exercise. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that in the future. Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on the show today. I really appreciate it. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. that's all for this month. In next month's show, we will be raising the roof for the construction industry. But not just any construction, we'll be getting an insight into the phenomena of 3D printing in building construction and the material science behind it. It's going to be a fabricating experience. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.